Hello, everybody. Nelson Virgil here with ExcelMail.com. I'm very happy to have Dr. Lawson from the Washington, D.C. area. She's a long-term friend of Excel Mail and the work we do with uh, men's health and testosterone replacement therapy, among other things. Uh, Dr. Lawson is the founder of a uh, medical director of a proactive wellness center of McLean, Virginia. So, am I pronouncing the town's name right, McLean? Well, it's actually Vienna. Vienna, but, okay, okay. In the, in but, the, but that's okay. Uh, Vienna, it's close. Uh, it's close. Right. It's founded, um, the center was founded in 2006 and is one of the leading anti-aging and functional medicine specialty practices in the metropolitan D.C. area, serving patients from Northern Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and surrounding areas. Some people even fly over a thousand miles to see Dr. Lawson. So Lawson specializes in treating men and women with hormone replacement, weight management, and a functional approach to treating and preventing chronic disease and therapies to reverse the symptoms of aging and enhancing overall wellness and longevity. Dr. Lawson is a diplomat in the anti-aging regenerative medicine with the American Board of Anti-Aging and is a board certified anesthesiologist and an avid researcher. She's always looking for new things to experiment and to try and goes to conferences. So she's here today to share uh, with us aspects of testosterone replacement therapy and beyond that we usually do not consider uh, either when we're thinking about starting therapy or uh, when we're monitored uh, while we're doing testosterone replacement. So welcome, Dr. Lawson. Thank you so much for, um, for volunteering for this new experiment uh, we're doing today of showing the PowerPoint slides um, and while you're speaking. So thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, why don't we start, um, you know, with your first introduction of the slides and, and what your topics will be. Okay, good. Okay, today we'll be talking about low thyroid function, insulin resistance, heart disease prevention, and SIRS. That stands for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Okay. And why are these, um, these different topics important to consider um, in men, so we, in men doing uh, TRT. So we're going to go through the first one, which is low thyroid. Okay. So um, a lot of men come to me and they really are fatigued. They just don't have the, the zest that they had for life. And so they think that testosterone replacement therapy is the only answer. And, and oftentimes that does make a big difference. But many times people suffer from hypothyroidism, which is low thyroid function. There's hyperthyroidism, but it's more common to have a patient who presents with hypothyroidism. Uh, it frequently does go undiagnosed, though, because people just look at the symptoms of fatigue, difficulty losing weight cold intolerance, uh, hair loss, brittle nails, they just, you know, it, it's so obvious to me that it, we have to look at the thyroid. But so many times physicians just don't even really ask the questions. And a lot of times we just think that it's because of low testosterone levels and, and we ignore it. But there are certain ways that we have to look at thyroid function and it goes along with doing the right test. Yeah, and that's, and that's a tricky part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's tricky. It really is. So when I do a thyroid function panel on, on someone, I check for the TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, the T3 free, the T4 free, and the thyro uh, thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Now, most doctors just check for a TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, as I just mentioned before. But thyroid stimulating <coughs> hormone is a pituitary hormone. And it doesn't always line up with what's happening peripherally with the actual thyroid hormones. Now, the T3 free is one of the most important lab tests that we need to look at. But most of the time, again, doctors will just look at TSH and free T4 if they look at the T3, T4 free at all. So we miss a lot of people just by not doing the right tests. <coughs> so before we move on, um, I just want to make this a uh open discussion. Why do you think there's such a barrier here when it comes to thyroid um, hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism diagnosis? Why are we using this TSH test as a main uh, uh, diagnosis test when we know we have data that shows that that may actually be not the only indicative um, factor involved? 
Uh, that's a great question. That's just the way doctors are taught. They're taught that way in medical school. They just look at the TSH. Okay, for example, the reference range from, for a thyroid stimulating hormone is 0.4 to 4.5. Now, a lot of doctors will look at the TSH, and if it's above 3 or 3.5, then they will say, oh, you have thyroid, uh, hypothyroidism, you have low thyroid function. But there are people who have a TSH at that lower end of the reference range, and again, it's a pituitary hormone. So sometimes the pituitary is not giving the, the best indicator of what's happening in the body, but that's just the way they've been taught. And it's been hard to shift a lot of doctors beyond that teaching that they've known for years and years and years. So uh, a lot of the integrative doctors these days, though, are doing the right test to come up with a diagnosis. And the other thing is, you, you look at the labs, but you can't just look at the labs only. A person is not a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at the labs, and you have to look at what's going on clinically in order to really make a diagnosis. Good point. I'm glad you uh, reviewed that. All right. Okay, so um, the most common um, thyroid medication is a T4 medication. Examples of those are Synthroid, levothyroxine, those are T4 only preparations. But a lot of people need T3. They're low in T3. They don't convert T4 to T3, and a lot of people do not do that. So if you don't check the T3 level and if you don't replace it, a lot of times people won't get better. So there are options for a T3, T4 thyroid medication, we can compound it. And, you know, we love our compounding pharmacies and I hope they continue to flourish and thrive, but compounding pharmacies can make very specific dosages of T3 and T4. Uh, we can get commercial preparations such as Armour Thyroid. It's a desiccated thyroid medication. Armour's not the only one. There are other derivatives that have different fillers such as West Throid, Nature Throid. But it's the T3 that really makes the difference in a lot of people. And I've seen uh, people who have been on thyroid medication, they still felt tired, they still weren't losing weight. And then as soon as we add the T3 to their regimen, it's like something magical happens and they're much better. So you have to look, if, a, if any of you think you have a problem with your thyroid function, you definitely want to have your doctor do a free T3, a free T4, and I like to see the free T3 and the high threes to the low fours. And we can talk about that at another time, but this is informational just to give you what you want to look for. Now, one more thing I want to mention is thyroid antibodies. A lot of us have autoimmune disease, and that's when our immune system starts to attack our own cells, our own tissues. And I've seen, for example, I saw a lady who had a... Um, had thyroid antibodies of greater than 1,000. Uh, depending on the lab that you go to, they should be less than 34 for um, Quest, less than nine for a LabCorp lab result, but her thyroid antibodies were greater than 1,000. And I said, has anybody ever tested that? That's an indication that the person has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And she had been on thyroid medication for 20 years and no one had ever tested. And so you know if you have one autoimmune disease, you are at risk for others. So you really want to make sure that you figure out why the body is attacking itself and address that as well. That's a good point. It's often misdiagnosed or not even looked at. I have a, I've known a few men that mm -hmm. had a TSH of 3.8 and their doctor mm -hmm. told them, oh, that's, you're okay. Mm -hmm. and, but they had all the symptoms and they went ahead and some, some men and women are obviously accessing uh, online uh, blood testing. You know, I have a company called these kind of labs. They, they say, well, you know, I'm still having all the symptoms. My doctor told me it was okay. They go mm -hmm. in, get their full thyroid panel, like you said, free, right. free T3, free T4, and antibodies. Well, right. I have you know, two people that had really high antibodies. So they had Hashimoto's, and their doctor had told them that the TSH was fine. Right. So it wasn't because they took uh, that extra step uh, obviously, the switch doctors, um, right. they would have never found out. <laughs> right, and, and it's nice that patients have access to be able to get the labs if they get opposition from their physician. Yeah, and he was wondering, one of them was wondering why testosterone was not working, and that was a good reason why. 
Exactly. So, okay, exactly. so we're starting now with uh, the insulin resistance uh, issue. Right, okay, insulin resistance is very common these days, and it's a precursor to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Now, um, diabetes is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. It's, it's a fast-growing health issue, and I see people who are insulin resistant who never knew that they were. They will tell me, oh, my blood sugar's fine, but they are insulin resistant, and we'll go over why we determine or how we determine, actually, that they are insulin resistant. So we, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so when the glucose level rises after a meal, the pancreas secretes insulin. And insulin is secreted in order to bring glucose into the cells or into the tissues to be utilized as energy. So when you eat a sugary or carbohydrate meal, the insulin level is gonna rise. But sometimes when we eat too much sugar, then our insulin levels become very, very high and it causes us to not be able to really, really utilize our insulin properly. And it causes the uh, people to even, for example, the insulin level will rise. You eat a sugary meal, the insulin level goes up to bring the blood sugar down. Sometimes it overshoots, the glucose gets too low, the person gets irritated, they have low blood sugar. So we really gotta look at our diet and make sure we're not challenging our bodies with too much sugar. But too much sugar is probably the main reason why some people, most people have diabetes. It's a, it's a lifestyle issue, really. Yeah, we're bombarded with food that contains sugar or hidden sugars. Exactly, exactly. Now, you know, they say that the standard American diet, is, it, it really is sad. But the average American consumes 150 pounds of sugar per year. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that crazy? That it's is a lot of sugar. Our ancestors never had any need for sugar. So I know, <laughs> I know. And then a lot of people are deceived, and the food industry really deceives us in that they will say, oh, something sugar-free, but if it's sugar-free it's got and it's sweet, it's got artificial sweeteners in it. And artificial sweeteners do the same thing with the insulin levels as does sugar, even worse. Actually, sugar is even healthier to eat than artificial sweeteners. But you know, we'll look at, we eat fat-free foods, we don't look at labels closely enough, anything that pretty much ends in os, maltose, dextrose, sucrose, sucralose, and then that's uh, what's in Splenda, what Splenda is made of, but those are not good for us and they lead to um, insulin resistance. Good point. Okay, again, I had said earlier that people will come, they'll say, oh, my blood sugar's fine, my doctor said it's fine, and one more point that I'd like to make is I'll, oftentimes I'll ask patients, well, do you have a copy of your lab work? Oh, no, the nurse just called and said everything was okay. Well, what does okay mean? You know, and I tell them, you wouldn't not get your bank statement. You know, you need to have a copy of your lab. You need to keep a notebook so you can follow trends and see really what's going on and track what's going on with your health. So a, glu a fasting glucose is not adequate. It is not enough to tell us whether or not a person is at risk for diabetes or if they're pre-diabetic. Now, these are conservative ranges, but for a normal person, a fasting blood sugar should be less than 100. In pre-diabetes, the, fast, the fasting blood sugar would be between 100 and 125, and with diabetes, it's 126 or higher. But that's not enough. Okay, if, okay, if someone uh, has a fasting glucose of 99, I'm not going to say, well, let's just watch it. I'm, I'm going to be aggressive about doing something about it because even 100 is, not, is too high in my mind. I really like to get the person's fasting blood sugar below 80. Now, we can look at more than just the blood sugar, or the fasting blood sugar rather, by looking at what's called the hemoglobin A1C. And the hemoglobin A1C gives us an indication of what's been going on with the patient's blood sugar over a 90 day period. So in a normal person that's not predisposed to diabetes, the A1C will be less than 5.7%. In pre-diabetes, it'll be 5.7 to 6.4%, and in diabetes, it's 6.5% or higher. Now, 
if a person's 5.7%, a lot of doctors will say, oh, well, you know, that's fine. Everything looks good. But again, I like to have my patient's lab results in optimal ranges and, and do something before it becomes a problem. So I really actually strive for my patient's A1C levels to be even in the low fives, high fours, although I don't see that very often because we drink, you know, too much alcohol at times. We, uh, yeah, as, again, as I said before, eat processed foods, fast foods. So we really want to check more than just the blood sugar. We want to look at the A1C. Another good marker, which is not on this chart, is the fructosamine. That shows what your blood sugar levels have been over a two to three week period. Really? And then, yeah, oh, two to three oh, fructosamine. Tell us a little bit more about that. I know we're trying to keep the, the presentation short, but right. I've never really heard about that test. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, another marker that, okay, for example, you could eat, know you're having lab work done and eat really well for, the, for two or three days prior to the blood test. Yeah. So you, you get a deceptively normal looking level of, of, of sugar, the blood sugar that's in your system. Yeah. But hemoglobin is, uh, hemoglobin A1C shows just the glucose that's uh, on, on the hemoglobin. And we turn blood cells over every 90 days, red blood cells over every 90 days. Now it's not a perfect marker, but it definitely, can give us an indication as to how much sugar is on that red blood cell. And, and a similar thing happens with fructosamine, but it gives us a shorter window of time as to what that patient's blood sugar has been like over a two to three week period. So all those are good. And then another thing I wanna mention before we go to the next slide is fasting insulin levels. Now, I always check fasting insulin levels. Now, I like to see the fasting insulin level below 10. Now, there's a, a lot of controversy on whether fasting insulin levels are really accurate and reliable. Mm. But, for example, if I see someone who has a blood sugar of 99, but their fasting insulin level is 59, and I see that all the time, I know that person is putting out a lot of insulin in order to keep that blood sugar low or normal. And that mechanism is going to break over time. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at all of those markers and look at what's going on clinically with the person's weight. Are they weight loss resistant? And that's, you know, the, all that information arms us with what we need to do to help get that patient back to a, a normal glucose and insulin uh, balance. Well, yeah, and what do you think about the uh, glucose tolerance test? Is that too much trouble to go through, like a separate sampling after mm -hmm. ingesting glucose? You know, they do that curve, yeah, two right? Hour, two hour GTT or right? No, I think it's a great test. And patients don't really want to do it. Yeah, but I, I think it gives us a lot of good information. So I, I recommend it from time to time, but uh, I don't do it all the time because if I just see that the person has signs of insulin resistance and their lab work indicates that they have it, I move to the next step and it's with the medication that you recommend frequently and that's metformin. So I, I tend to just treat, I don't always do a glucose tolerance test. I do very few, but I think it is a great test. Yeah, great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, so the first line of treatment is obviously diet and exercise. You, you know, have a diet that mainly focuses on uh, just a little bit of fruit and low glycemic fruits, but vegetables, low fat proteins, but metformin is one of my favorite medications to use. And it was originally a botanical. So people get paranoid about using it. They'll say, oh, that's for diabetes. And you know, I'll tell them that, you know, we want to prevent you from developing diabetes. But metformin has so many other benefits other than improving insulin sensitivity. It actually decreases uh, the incidence of a lot of different cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, even pancreatic cancer. So I use metformin 
on a regular basis. So that's one of my first go-to medications to use for insulin resistance. Yeah, there's actually a large study being enrolling right now, funded by the U.S. government, um, mm -hmm. to look at forming for you know survival and aging. So right, it's encouraging. So the, even the U.S. the NIH is looking into metformin. So hopefully yeah. the results were good. So. Yeah, no, I'm excited about that. And, and believe it or not, uh, uh, people have come to me who don't have insulin resistance and they are interested in taking metformin because it's not going to just drop your blood sugar. It's just going to improve the way your insulin works. Cancers feed off of sugar and insulin. So getting your glucose balance and insulin balance under control is extremely important. I also tell people though they start metforming, they think is uh, they have a it's an open door to eating um, higher sugar foods, you know, and that's not that shouldn't be the case. It's that should like, not be the case yeah, at all. It's not like a you know a passport to get you into cheating more often. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about cardiovascular disease, disease because it is the leading cause of death in men and women. It's primarily due to atherosclerosis, which is plaque buildup in the walls of the arteries. So the, what happens is the plaque will cause narrowing in the arteries. It makes it harder for blood to flow through the arteries. And a lot of times a clot can form in the artery, which can uh, block the arterial blood flow. And that can increase one's risk for a heart attack or stroke. So we definitely want to do everything we can do to diagnose cardiovascular disease and treat it and be aggressive about it when we find that a person does have risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Okay, I'm sure that most people uh, have had their lipid panel done. And most people will say to me, well, no, my, my cholesterol is fine. It's, you know, 190 and they think they have, and my HDLs are high. You know, the HDLs, I tell people they're the healthy cholesterol. The LDLs are the lousy cholesterol. So most people are deceived into believing that because their cholesterol is less than 200 and their HDLs are greater than 60, that they're okay. But I, I find with the testing that I do, that goes beyond just blood testing, that I have seen people who have cholesterol levels of 385 who have no plaque in their arteries. And I've seen people who have cholesterol levels of 170 and they have a significant amount of plaque in their arteries. So lipid panel scores are, or cholesterol levels are really a poor indication of whether you're at risk for cardiovascular disease. It's a marker and it's an important one because if it's high, it helps us to look beyond just the, that particular um, result and we look a little bit deeper. But if it's normal, it doesn't mean that we don't need to look for cardiovascular disease risk. Good point. And this is, uh, we're talking about fasting lipids, right? Fasting, exactly. Fasting, uh, fasting lipid panel, correct. Now, the things that I do in my practice, and, and I've been doing this for several years now, we actually have a uh, ultrasound, a specialized ultrasound that we measure uh, what's uh, the plaque formation, the arterial wall thickness, it's called a CIMT scan, carotid intima media thickness. So it's an ultrasound that we do here in the office. We look at what's going on with the arterial wall. Is it thickened or not? Because that's an indication of atherosclerosis. We look at whether or not there's any narrowing in the artery. We, this test tells whether or not there's mixed plaque or soft plaque in the arteries. Soft plaque is vulnerable to rupture. So if a person has soft plaque or mixed plaque, which is a combination of calcified and soft plaque, we really want to be aggressive with, with their therapy. We really want to make sure that we eliminate their risk factors for developing heart disease. Now, other markers that we look at that are lab tests that go beyond the standard lipid panel, there's a marker called an ApoB. It's just an advanced marker. It it'll, would take a long time to explain the significance of all of these markers, but LP little a, lipoprotein A, it's another marker that we can even lower LP little a by even just giving niacin. 
and typically I'll give a thousand milligrams of niacin and I don't use the flush free niacin, I use the niacin that makes you flush. There is another marker called the LPPLA2. It's, a, it's sometimes called a plaque score and it'll tell us whether a person has arterial infl inflammation. And a, uh, the fibrinogen level is another marker that increases our risk for clotting. And fibrinogen levels, if your fibrinogen level is high and you're a smoker, you need to stop because that causes the fibrinogen levels to rise even further. So if I see a, an elevated fibrinogen level, I'm going to give the patient a supplement. Uh, there's natokinase, lumbrokinase. So there are things, there are interventions that we can do to improve this um, inflammation and increase the propensity to clotting, but we need to know that there's a problem so we can do something about it. Now, the other thing with LDLs, a person's LDL cholesterol can be normal. It can be less than 100. But what, what matters is the size of those LDL particles. For example, if a person has a lot of small, dense particles, they are more at risk for developing plaque. And, and I explained to everybody that the inside of our artery is like a tennis net. There's an endothelial lining in, inside that artery. So if, if you throw a, I'm telling my age now, if you throw a jack ball or a marble up against a tennis net, it can go through the hole and get to the other side. So if you have a very, if you have very small LDL particles, they can go through the little hole in that endothelial lining, go to the other side, uh, oxidize in the artery and cause plaque. If you have larger LDL particles, they tend to bounce off that artery and keep flowing. So you want larger LDL particles and the small ones are bad, but again, we need to know that they're there so we know how to proceed with treatment. That's a great analogy, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so statin drugs are the first line of treatment for uh, elevated lipid panels, but, but again, if a person has a high cholesterol level and they have zero plaque in their arteries and we look at other inflammatory markers such as a cardio CRP and they have very little inflammation, then there would be, it's, it's, it shouldn't be just a knee jerk reaction to just prescribe a statin. Now, there are so many people who are totally anti-statin and I'm not anti-statin at all, but I think that statins should be prescribed for people who really need them. And some people do need them. For example, if you have a high, you have a lot of plaque in your arteries, you have a lot of inflammation. For example, the cardio CRP level should be less than one. If it's between one and three, that puts you at an average cardiovascular risk. If the cardio CRP is greater than three, it puts you at a high cardiovascular risk. So you want a statin for its anti-inflammatory benefits, and it helps to stabilize and calcify plaque. But if a person does need a statin, then they really do need to take a high dose of CoQ10, coenzyme Q10. It's an enzyme that we make in our bodies, and statins deplete the production of CoQ10. And when you have low CoQ10 levels, that predisposes one to heart failure. So it has been said that heart failure is primarily due to a CoQ10 deficiency. And so many people are on statins who don't need to be on them. And then there are people that do need to be on them, but they're not taking any CoQ10. So if you're gonna give the drug, you need to make sure that you're not gonna get the side effects of what that drug can do by decreasing the CoQ10 levels in production. Yeah, and that also affects low levels of CoQ10 can also affect um, muscle regeneration and there's a lot more myopathy and muscle related issues with people taking statins too. They complain of pains and aches. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. And, and there are even some genetic tests that can, uh, some of the cardiovascular, advanced cardiovascular labs even do a genetic test to predict whether a person will have a statin myopathy or not. So if a person needed a statin and we knew they were at risk for the myalgias that go along with it, a lot of times they need to be given CoQ10 even prior to starting a statin and also magnesium as well. So um, that, that is a good point. You do have to be real careful about the uh, muscle pain that can occur with it and it does happen.
the point. So, so before we go on, um, so you know, I know the statin industry, the pharmaceutical industry, has been pushing for, you know, the use of statins even for people with lower, uh, you know, LDL levels. So why, um, why so many doctors prescribing them instead of looking at other ways to address the problem, you know, or even the diagnostics of it? Uh, what, right. what do you think there's such a barrier? Is that only pharmaceutical lobbying or the educational lectures and CME programs that doctors take? Why, why is this cardiology world not embracing, you know, issues around looking into other factors before statin therapy, before they actually jump into that treatment? Right. Well, there's a lot of money that is involved in the uh, prescribing of statins. It's a $40 billion industry. Um, the other thing is that I, I think a lot of doctors, okay, they don't know. And they just, they don't know that they don't know. And that's just what they've been taught. And the other thing is that um, they just, they don't realize that 60% of people who have a first time heart attack have normal cholesterol levels. So they've just been trained to think that high cholesterol, that cholesterol is the enemy. And we know that is not the case because we even need cholesterol to make our hormones. We need it to make our testosterone, our estradiol, our, you know, all of our reproductive hormones. But that's just what they've done. Uh, they don't have time uh, oftentimes to uh, really look at other risk factors. They have six to eight minutes. I think uh, there are multiple reasons why they do that, but I think it's just because that's what they've always done. Uh, the pharmaceutical reps come in, they tell them about a new statin, and, and that's just the only tool in their toolbox. And what I see also, there are barriers to getting insurance companies to pay for some of the diagnostic tests that go beyond just a lipid panel. Which is that is thing. true. And that really gets in the way of, uh, for even doctors to, they're working within, you know, the insurance, uh, in, you know, reimbursement uh, system to right. even, uh, you know, trying to use the diagnostic test. So hopefully they'll get validated eventually. But yes, we all know the insurance situation in this country, even though we're having more access, there are more limitations on exactly. what gets paid for. So, yes. Yeah. One thing I want to point out, and, and this is when I learned about the thyroid and the cholesterol link. So I had a lady a few years ago and she ran up the stairs to my office and she worked out every day and she played tennis every day and it, she was really healthy. She wasn't overweight. She didn't have any, any signs of hypothyroidism at all, mm. but her cholesterol was 385, but her T3 free was 1.9. I, I really like to see it in the high threes, low fours. So I said, you know, there must be some connection between low thyroid function and cholesterol. And I validated it, and the labs do make errors. So if a lab test doesn't make sense, you do have to repeat it sometimes. But I treated her with the equivalent of one grain, which is 60 milligrams of armor thyroid, and her cholesterol came down 200 points. Wow. It came down from 385 to under, well, to 185 in six weeks. And that was just given thyroid medication. So you, you have to just really have a broad understanding of what could be going on with the patient. Why do they have elevated cholesterol levels? I, I see people with low testosterone levels who have elevated cholesterol levels. So you, you've really got to look in a lot of different areas. That's a very good point, very good point. It, um... Anything else you want to expand on this on this uh, slide? Uh, not really. I, I will say one thing. Um, so I see men who come to me with a cholesterol, they're on a statin, they have a cholesterol level of 119, and they're fatigued, and their testosterone levels are low. And I tell them, you can't, you can't even make testosterone if your cholesterol levels are that low. So um, it's just, um, we could go on about this for hours, but, you know, just know that there are other reasons for cholesterol levels being high other than your body is just making too much of it and you need to lower it with a statin. Good. Good point. 
Okay, we don't have to spend, I think we've you know, mainly covered most of what's here, but I will say that a lot of people come to me who have high blood pressure and they are on two or three different blood pressure medications. And um, I learned this from Stephen Sinatra. He's an integrative cardiologist. He has a book entitled Reverse Heart Disease Now. And he uses Hawthorne, magnesium, D-ribose, and CoQ10. Now, those are four different supplements that one has to use in, um, in order to bring the blood pressure down, but I've seen it work beautifully. And um, I would rather get to the root of why my blood pressure is high than to just give a blood pressure medication. It was kind of funny. I had a lady call me the other day. We optimized her hormones, and she had been on three different blood pressure medications, and she called me and she said, you know, do, do these hormones lower my blood pressure? She said, my blood pressure is really low now. And I said, well, you know, we can probably start to wean you off of some of these blood pressure medications that you're on. So she's off all three blood pressure medications. And she, um, you know, as, as again, I said, she was on three of them. And even just balancing hormones can can make such a huge difference in our overall health blood pressure included and you know on weight loss which also when you get your hormones balanced you mm -hmm. also tend to have some weight loss too and that that's true improves blood pressure too and, and blood pressure medications are uh, there's a big topic on excel mail because mm -hmm. as we well know most of them i don't think there's one better than the other so there's some of them affect right. sexual functioning men Absolutely. So a lot of guys, and we have over 14,000 guys on our cell mail, they're mm -hmm. terrified of right. blood pressure medications. They're looking right. for other natural ways to, to decrease blood pressure. Right. And, and some of them do have issues with increased blood pressure with uh, start taking higher doses of testosterone and all the things. Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So it is a big, big topic in my world. Right. Yes. Right, I know. And, and offline, we can talk about, you know, some of the things I've done to uh, improve blood pressure so we can talk about that but there definitely are options beyond just taking a blood pressure medication thank you okay we're on the home stretch now so sirs chronic inflammatory response syndrome i'm really very excited about this it's also called a biotoxin illness so I, I learned about this about 18 months ago. I had a guy that came into my office and he had a left-sided tremor. He had a tremor in his left hand and his left leg. And he had been treated for Parkinson's disease. But his wife said, I, I don't really, he's not getting any better with the medication. I, I think that it's something else. And she actually said, you know, I've been reading about mold toxicity. Well, I didn't really know that much about it at the time, but, but again, I'm always interested to learn something new. So chronic inflammatory response syndrome is a response that people have as inflammation that's due to being exposed to uh, inflammagens, molds, toxins that are in a water damaged building. And not only just water damaged buildings, but even certain fish like um, red snapper, grouper, amberjack, eel, they can contain a toxin called ciguatera. And some of us genetically are just unable to clear our bodies of those toxins. So the toxins begin to continue to circulate throughout the systemic circulation and can cause a lot of different issues and health concerns and some of the concerns mimic what's going on with low testosterone levels. So we can uh, look at the biotoxin pathway. That's the next slide. Interesting topic that nobody talks about. <laughs> okay, now obviously we're not going to go through every single step of this biotoxin pathway, but over on the left-hand side it says the body acquires a biotoxin or toxin-producing organism from food, water, air, or bug bites. Now, if we, so we test for HLA genetic susceptibility. That's the human leukocyte antigen that's on chromosome six. Now on the left-hand side, we have a desired outcome in a healthy patient. If the patient is not HLA susceptible to not being able to clear toxins, and they, what will happen is the adaptive we have two types of immune responses. There's the adaptive immune response. So the adaptive immune response 
sees a foreign invader, sees this toxin, develops an antibody and gets rid of it, specifically targets that toxin and eliminates that, that antigen or that foreign agent that is, has entered the body. So that's what you want to happen. So the adaptive immune response is, is like a, I say it's like a trained sniper. It, it's very targeted. It picks off that particular toxin and gets rid of it. Now, what happens if on that first purple arrow up at the top, it says HLA susceptible? So what happens at that point if a person is HLA susceptible, meaning that, and 25% of people, believe it or not, are genetically not able to clear these particular biotoxins. So what will happen is they'll go through, their immune system starts to take over, their innate immune system takes over, and the innate immune system, I liken that onto a, uh, someone in a room that's blindfolded with a gun or a rifle or a machine gun, and he's just shooting at everything, just trying to take out everything. So this is when people start to develop autoimmunity. Mm. And there are tests that we do that I had never heard of other than, you know, when I started to study this over the last 18 months, but there's TGF beta one, there's C3A, C4A, it measures a complement system. But the one that is most important down in the middle uh, at, with those orange arrows uh, going off from it, is, it says reduced MSH. That's melanocyte stimulating hormone. So when our bodies are, and a susceptible person is exposed to toxins that they can't rid the, their bodies of, they will develop low melanocyte stimulating hormone levels that can cause all sorts of issues in a patient. It can cause sleep disturbances, chronic pain, gastrointestinal issues, uh, prolonged illness. Believe it or not, it can also even cause low testosterone levels, low hormone levels in people. And it can also cause people to become leptin resistant. And I've had patients who are weight loss resistant and I know they'll tell me, I've gained 30 pounds over the last year. I've not eaten anything any differently. I exercise all the time. And they might not have a lot of the symptoms that most people have who have chronic inflammatory response syndrome. But I have looked for biotoxin um, exposure and, and these patients and a lot of these patients who have weight loss resistance actually have SIR. So it's really an interesting feel. I've had patients with um, fibromyalgia and fatigue, you know, and they really had SIRS. I've had patients with migraine headaches because what will happen is this inflammatory response will cause certain parts of our brain to have uh, uh, develop edema. And so you can see certain fingerprints when you look at an MRI. There's an add-on uh, to an MRI called a neuroquant. And so we can see changes in the brain. We can see changes in the blood work. There's some new cutting-edge genomic testing that will be available. At, well, it's actually available now. It's very expensive. But we can see exactly how to treat a patient, and it's the best that we have in offering personalized medicine. But when you think about 25% of people being susceptible to developing this type of inflammatory response, you know, I'm just seeing so many people who are being treated based upon their symptoms, but we're not getting to the root of, root of the issue. I'm really looking forward to getting this test done myself. I'm telling you. Right. Because right. I obviously have an immune uh, deficiency myself, and I do have inflammatory uh, issues. So yeah. I'm and very curious. So I'll, yeah. I'll be writing something about my experiences. I'm definitely, okay. I'm going to be using your services for this for sure. Okay. I'll definitely tell you all of the tests that you need. And, um, you know, it can be a scary thing for people. You know, my mother, and I'll, you know, close it with, with this, but... I, I knew about SIRS and, and probably it was meant for me to know so that I could really help to save my mom's life. So oh, really? she had, um, she lived in Michigan. I knew her basement was um, moist. I knew she used dehumidifiers, but she told me one day, you know, I've been really emptying these dehumidifiers, you know, every day, all three of them. And 
One of them had some black sediment in, in it. And so I thought, hmm, that sounds like mold. Although not all molds are, are black. Stachybotrys is black, but there are other molds that, are, that have no color at all. And then you can have patients who, or people who can live in a, a, a home with black mold growing all up the wall and they don't get sick, but then there are others that, that will. But anyway, I did her lab test and I, I found out they were worse than anybody's tests that I had ever seen before. Yeah. So I told her, I said, you've got to get, I, we tested the home. That's another long story. And I don't want to keep people online, you know, too much longer. But we actually tested her home looking at a test that looked at the DNA of the moles that um, were in her home. And for example, this is it's called an ERMI test, Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. So the scale goes from uh, minus 10 to 20. And you really want to see that ERMI score below 2. And my mother's was 19.3. So I knew there was a really bad problem. I had somebody go out and inspect her house who was a really qualified person to look for areas of water intrusion and, and, and um, breaches in the building envelope and whatnot. But the woman told me, she said, your mom's house is beautiful. It doesn't look like there's an issue, but it's like a supermodel with bone cancer. That so I know, but I had to actually, because her house was so bad and her labs were so so compromised by this immune response that that she was experiencing she had to get rid of everything porous i mean furniture you know, um, mattresses you know you can wash your clothing so it, it's really an interesting feel and the sicker the patient is the more aggressive you need to be with the remediation and some some people have to move out of their home but it's really a fascinating feel is your mom feeling better well, you know, believe it or not, my mom really didn't feel bad. The only, the, she had a little bit of a sore throat. And I really think it's because, so you can have, okay, let's go over the symptoms, actually. Chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, depression. You know, so these are diseases that SIRS is e easily confused with. But in the case of my mother, I really believe, in, and I can't validate it or verify it, but I really think it's because her hormones have always been balanced. We have her blood sugars under control. Uh, you know, she's on metformin. Uh, she takes, you know, her fish oils. She, she does all of the things that we do in an integrative practice. And so I really think that kept her from really being ill. Good. And, you know, a lot of, a uh, few of this, um, like uh, even Lyme disease, and some doctors actually even minimize the existence of, mm -hmm. of these issues too. So but obviously we're talking about education again. Right. And then Lyme is um, actually, Lyme is a biotoxin. The Borrelia, mm -hmm. it, it uh, causes a toxin to be uh, maintained in the body and the, the immune response reacts to that toxin. But believe it or not, a lot of people that I've seen with Lyme disease, get this okay there was a girl who was 15 she was diagnosed with lyme disease she came to me for iv vitamin treatments her doctor had sent her to me for that so we did that and she felt a little bit better but she really wasn't getting as as healthy as her mother wanted her to be so she came to the mother came to me and said you've got to look further something else is going on we did the blood test to look for SIRS, but we did an MRI of her brain and looked at the neural quant that I mentioned before. And there are certain fingerprints on a neural quant that are indicative of mold toxicity. And there are certain fingerprints that are indicative of Lyme disease. So she actually didn't, I'm not saying she never had Lyme, but Lyme wasn't what was impacting her health at that point. And so we discontinued her antibiotics. We treated her for her mold toxicity. And there are a lot of steps to doing that. But she uh, had been homeschooled because she wasn't able to really, she didn't have the stamina to, uh, and energy to be in school full time. But I just uh, found out that she has gone back to school now. She went back this fall. So it really made a difference in, in her um, overall health. Wow. Great success story. Right, right. Uh, go to the next slide or? Next slide. And I think we'll, we're about ready to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. But 
Um, there's, you know, I, I think I'm just gonna say this briefly because I could go on and on, but there's a visual test that you do. There is a website called VCS test, visual contrast sensitivity um, testing. So vcstest.com. And it tests what is going on with the optic nerve. Because when you have SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome, the optic nerves don't get good blood flow. And so your visual uh, perceptions of certain images and being able to distinguish certain patterns is compromised. So one of the things that we use to monitor a patient's improvement is their VCS test. So if a person has, there are 37 symptoms that are associated with SERVs. If a patient has eight or more symptoms that are on that list of 37, and their visual contrast sensitivity test is positive for biotoxins, there's a 98% chance that that person does have SIRS. So it gives us more information. It's, it's just a multi-system, multi-symptom um, um, multi disease, and we have to use multiple methods in order to diagnose it. So VCS testing is, is one that we definitely use. Good point. This is uh, such a new field, uh, at least for me. Uh, just right, really right. Exposure right. to this, and I think I've already gone over, you know, these most of these points. Um, and then um, let's see, next one we did that. Next one, I talked about ERMI testing. I talked about genomics. I talked about the MRI with NeuroQuant. I didn't specifically talk about each lab. Uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of steps. It's a 12-step program to treating a patient who does have SIRS. And, you know, we won't go into all of that, but one of the key things you want to do is if it is, if the SIRS is really due to being exposed to a water-damaged building, you have to remove the patient from the exposure. And then we do use binders such as Wellcall and cholestyramine to help bind those toxins and get them out of the body through the uh, GI tract. So it's a, big, it's a big process to treating these patients, but the outcomes are just so wonderful when the patients get better. And their MRIs, their brain actually improves. So that's really exciting as well. Wow. All right, I think I've already said all of that, but you know, the bottom line, Nelson, is, is each of us is genetically unique and different. And we can't treat patients in a cookie cutter fashion. We have to look at each person and provide the best personalized approach for that particular patient because all of us are different. You know, I, I really have to thank you because, um, you know, I do a few of these lectures uh, with, uh, online with different doctors mm -hmm. and you have, today, you have brought very, a very different view of other factors that could be impacting a lot of my, um, you know, audience right. that they have no awareness of. I'm one of them. This third um, topic, um, completely new to me. Right, right. Well, I'm happy to share what I know. I, I've learned a lot about it, and I'm happy to share it with you and anybody who's willing to listen. Yeah, and I really want to thank you. And I can tell this is going to be the first of several lectures with you because I'm sure you can talk for hours about different topics. Oh, um, yeah. I definitely want to do one specifically focusing on women. Uh -huh. um, although my, my site is called excelmail.com, we have a folder, a forum um, section that is called, you know, Excel Females for Women. Mm -hmm. because every, right. man has, every man has a woman that they care for, either, you know, spouse right. or even a mother right um, exactly and, and when they come into my site they end up asking questions about how and this is our guys are actually starting testosterone they feel better mm -hmm. and and it makes a huge difference they're feeling better and their wives or their girlfriends are still not feeling as good as they are right. so they bring them up to right. that level so i'm seeing more and more interest even to educate men about women's health right and, and right for that purpose. So I'm definitely going to be, uh, you know, bothering you again for another one of these. 
Well, it's not a bother at all. I love to do it. So I'm happy that you invited me to do this. It's been a lot of fun and we'll be talking. Yeah. And let me, uh, one more thing. How do people get a hold of your clinic, uh, website, phone number? Okay. Uh, my website is proactivewellness.com. Uh, our phone number is 703-822-5003. Um, you can uh, even email at info at proactivewellness.com and someone will uh, respond to you if you have any questions. Well, thank you so much once again, and uh, we're looking forward to the next one. Okay, thanks, Nelson. Take you care. Have a nice weekend. You take okay, care. you too. Bye-bye.